is um, physically unclonable functions in the universal composition framework. Christina Bruzuska, Mark Fischlin, Heike Schroeder, and Stefan Katzenbeiser. And Christina will give the talk. Phil, I think that people are petrified from you, the speakers. Nobody is going sense. over. They're all under. Like Except for Evgeny, of course. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm Christina Bruska. Um, this is joint work with Mark Fischlin, Heike Schröder, and Stefan Katzenbeiser. We are all from uh, TU Darmstadt. And so the topic is physically unclonable functions in the universal composition framework. Um, there's a lot of UC stuff um, in the paper, but I try to keep the UC part um, small for the talk so that you don't need to be familiar with the universal composition framework uh, to follow the talk. Okay, so um, physically unclonable functions are um, hardware tokens which um, get an input, a, a challenge, a stimulus, and produce a um, fuzzy output. And um, there are a lot of implementations for PUFFs, and they satisfy different security properties. So not all of them satisfy the same security properties. Uh, security properties are somewhat informal. So um, if you want to use PUFFs for cryptographic applications, you would like to have a formal security model so um, that you know what the formal security properties are and that you can use them to construct provable secure schemes. Um, so the, uh, the formal security model should, of course, cover what like, most PUFF constructions actually achieve. And um, that's what our paper is on. So uh, providing such a formal security definition and uh, several cryptographic applications. So um, uh, you can think of PUFF, like for now, um, as a random function in a box that you can send to another party, and then you can use this to construct a cryptographic scheme. Uh, what we did was we constructed the key agreement scheme, um, uh, the Livigas transfer scheme, um, and a commitment scheme. And the nice thing about the commitment scheme is that just on the way, we found a run-around transformation from oblivious transfer to commitment schemes. Um, and compared to like um, common cut and choose techniques, um, that's a very efficient transformation, which we just discovered on the way. So that was very nice. Um, um, so um, just for those who are familiar with uh, the universal composition framework, um, so you can think of paths as being like non-programmable random oracles. And um, then there is something very surprising about, um, about building a UC secure commitment scheme in the universal composition framework, um, because uh, Kennedy uh, and Fischlin showed in 2001 that you cannot have UC secure commitments in the plane model, and the proof also extends to the non-programmable random oracle model. So um, that we could actually do this from paths was um, um, uh, yeah, it was a, was, a, was a bit surprising. It just showed that there is a difference and that you can do even more with puffs than you can do with non-programmable random oracles. Um, so physically unclonable functions are hardware tokens which, um, uh, which get a stimulus, usually called a challenge. And um, it's a randomized procedure which uh, produces an output. Um, so if you plug in the same value twice, you do not necessarily get uh, the same output, so the measurement is somewhat fuzzy. Um, but um, it's fuzzy in a controlled way, so um, uh, the, bound, uh, the noise is bounded and you, um, you have some control about the output. Um, the second property that puffs usually have is um, if you take a fresh challenge value, uh, then you have some entropy about, about the output. Um, so um, these two properties 
are, um, are achieved by, um, by most path constructions. Um, but there was something else that we uh, needed for our applications, and that was a super, no super polynomial big input domain. Um, that's not achieved by all paths, but by some paths. Um, so, like, if you if you say like bounded noise and high entropy for fresh challenge values, uh, that's the definition according to what paths um, all paths achieve, um, and that's our definition for what we needed for our applications. Uh, so, like, wh how, why do we need the super polynomial big input domain? So, um, so uh, this is because we consider active attackers, and so Bob wants to send a path to Alice, and um, then uh, use this this function to, um, um, yeah, for example, to communicate with Alice in, in a secure way. Um, so Bob sends the path to Alice, but on the way, the attacker gets to measure the path, and then the path gets to Alice. So if the input domain is small, then the adversary can measure the whole path, and um, there is uh, not much left, which is secret between Bob and Alice, which the attacker does not know. So um, that's why we needed a big input domain. Um, like for weaker attack models, you can, um, you can still use the paths with the small input domains, but, um, yeah, so our input domain is big. Okay, so um, I said we wanted to have a random function in a box, but the problem is that a path is not a function because the measurement is fuzzy. And the other problem is that uh, you get high entropy outputs, uh, but you don't get uniform outputs. So um, uh, that's where fuzzy extractors come into play. So uh, fuzzy extractors do both things at the same time, so they do the error protection for you, and um, they smooth out the entropy. So, um, so then actually, if you put together the puff and the fuzzy extractor, this is almost like a random function in a box. So, um, um, well, it, there is some subtlety. Uh, so if, if two input values are close, you might actually get close values, but if input values are far away from each other, then, then you're fine. Um, so um, what are the main three properties that we needed of this uh, puff plus fuzzy extractor? Uh, so the first one is correctness, so that um, the puff plus the fuzzy extractor actually gives you a function. Um, the second property is the well-spread domain property, that's why the domain needed to be big. So if you, um, um, if you, if you measure the path a couple of time and then draw a random challenge, then usually the challenge is far away from the ones that you measured previously, if there were not too many, of course. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, you don't know um, anything about the output of uh, fuzzy extractor plus puff. So the, uh, the output is actually uniform. Um, so uh, let's have a look at key agreement as a warm up. So um, we have a key agreement scheme where uh, Bob measures the path on a challenge C, uh, gets a response R, applies the fuzzy extractor, and then derives the key K. Then Bob sends over the path to Alice. On the way, the attacker gets to measure the path, and then um, um, uh, at some point, the path uh, gets to Alice. And then Bob sends over uh, the challenge to Alice and information about the fuzzy extractor. Uh, as we heard before, there's some public information about um, uh, fuzzy extractors that you always need to transmit. Um, and then um, Alice can um, evaluate the path on this challenge, um, get a response R prime, which is close to the original one, and then apply the fuzzy extractor which, with the information that Alice got from Bob and derive the key K. So um, why does Alice actually derive the same key? So that's due to the correctness property of this construction puff plus fuzzy extractor. Um, and why is the scheme secure? So um, if, you, uh, if you look at the scheme, at the point where the adversary gets to measure the puff, the challenge C is information theoretically hidden from the adversary. Um, so due to the well-spread domain property, um, the challenge C is far away from, um, 
all values that the adversary measured. And in this case, we had this uniform output property, which said that in this case, uh, the value k uh, looks uniformly at random from the point of view of the adversary. Um, okay, so um, I promised the one round transformation from oblivious transfer to commitment schemes. I will then, after the slide, uh, show how to build a oblivious transfer scheme from PAPS. Um, but I, I'd like to show this, this one round transformation first. So, um, um, so these, these boxes represent a protocol. So an oblivious transfer protocol, um, um, their Bob has two secrets, S0 and S1, and Alice has a secret bit B. And um, so um, the secret bit B and the two secrets of Bob are used in the protocol. And in the end of the protocol, Alice derives the secret SB. Um, so the security properties of oblivious transfer are that um, Bob does not learn anything about the secret bit B of Alice, and that Alice can only derive one of the secrets. Um, a commitment scheme um, is a scheme which operates in two phases. So in the first phase, um, Alice commits to the bit B, and in the second phase, um, Alice can open her commitment and Bob learns the bit B. So the security properties about the commitment scheme are that in the first phase, the bit B remains hidden from Bob and um, that in the second phase, Alice cannot cheat and say, yeah, my bit was one minus B. Um, so um, if, you, if you look at these, these two, two protocols, um, there are some similarities. So for instance, in the oblivious transfer protocol, the bit B remains secret. Um, that's the same thing as you have um, there in the commitment protocol there, the bit B should remain secret in the first phase of the protocol. Um, and um, so uh, if you look at the oblivious transfer protocol, um, Alice only learns uh, one of the secrets, so the one which corresponded to her secret bit B. So um, if you say that the, the oblivious transfer protocol up there is um, the first, so okay, uh, is the first, um, the, f the, the committing phase of the commitment protocol. Um, then, you, then Alice can open, um, open the commitment by um, sending back the secret uh, to Bob. And uh, she can kind of cheat because uh, if the secret that Bob used was long, then um, Alice doesn't have very low probability of uh, sending the right secret um, S1 minus B to Bob. Um, so um, the main idea of this transformation was like to swap the, um, the role of the receiver and the role of the sender. Um, and um, yeah, then was one message you can get from oblivious transfer to commitment schemes. Okay, so um, I will go, um, uh, through our um, uh, oblivious transfer protocol. There, um, okay, Bob has two secrets, S0 and S1. Alice has a secret bit B. Alice draws a random challenge and measures the path on it, then sends over the path to Bob. Bob draws the random values, sends them over to Alice, and then Alice chooses one of the values according to her secret bit B and blinds them with the random challenge that, uh, uh, with a random challenge. Um, then, um, so now um, if, um, so Alice only evaluated the path on C. So um, Bob will now, now use the value C to, um, to compute a, a, a blinding value to send over his secrets to Alice. But Bob does not know whether Alice chose um, X0 or X1, so, um, Bob just computes a blinding value for, for both cases. So uh, X or X0 to the value he received and computes a blinding value ST0 and X or uh, X1 to the value he received to uh, compute another blinding value. Um, and then Bob sends over um, uh, his two secrets blinded with the two blinding values and um, information about the value extractor and then um, Alice can compute the blinding value for, um, um, for uh, XB. And um, so,
So, um, so uh, security um, against Alice comes from the properties. So you need that uh, Alice can only compute one of the blinding values. Um, that's uh, roughly because um, the values x0 and x1 are, um, are random and um, Alice cannot, um, cannot predict the value that she needs to measure the puff on. And then, um, um, and uh, security uh, against Bob, so that the sec uh, secret bit B uh, remains secret from Bob, uh, that's information theoretic because the only information that Bob receives about the secret bit, um, well, there's nothing. He just, um, he just uh, receives a random value, which is uh, X, B, X, or C. Um, and so if you, um, if you recall the commitment scheme that we built out of the oblivious transfer scheme, um, that the secret bit remains, uh, remains hidden was, um, uh, was one of the, the important properties and that the um, security is information th theoretic here helped actually a lot to make the commitment scheme not only UC secure but even secure against adaptive corruptions. That was, um, that was pretty, uh, pretty nice. Okay, so um, uh, what we did was um, we provided a definition for physically unclonable functions, um, which was bounded noise, high entropy for fresh input values, and super polynomial big input domain. Uh, we put a fuzzy extractor on top of it and uh, got the properties of correctness, well spread domain, and uniform outputs. And um, we got several efficient, uh, provable, secure pro properties without cryptographic assumptions, so only with the assumption of having a good puff, uh, which are key agreement, oblivious transfer, and uh, commitments. And on the way, we found a one right transformation from oblivious transfer. Um, um, what you can keep in mind is that puffs plus fuzzy extractors are somewhat like non programmable rare and oracles, but apparently, you can even do more with. Puffs. So um, I wanted to put pictures of my co-authors here because not all of them can be here today. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Okay. So, oh, yes. Please. Right. Um, I, I did not get the advantage. Why are puffs defined to, as being fuzzy? Why don't you have a deterministic puff? What's the point of being fuzzy? Uh, well, the, the puffs that exist are, f um, are just fuzzy. So uh, it would be ni of course, it would be much nicer to have, um, to have puffs which, which are a function, actually, but they're not. All right, so puffs actually do exist uh, at the moment. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So thank you again to all the speakers in the session. Um, we now have a break until um, 11 o'clock.